Welcome to Shop Talk Live episode number 225. Today, Anissa Barry and I battle the gods of Wi-Fi to bring you a remote podcast. And we talk about whether a wood shop can be considered a studio, when a listener should put down the pine and the poplar and step up to some real wood. That's a joke, people. One listener wanting to change the design of a bed so that he doesn't have to use plywood. A good method for another listener to do mortise and tenon joints for the first time on a farm table for his family. And one listener asked me to ramble a little bit about getting into Luthery and what my favorite resources have been for that. All that and a lot more in this episode of Shop Talk Live. Have you heard about Festool USA's new cordless tool lineup? Festool packed top shelf performance and value in these new tools. The TID18 Impact Driver and T18 Easy Drill Driver both start at just $199. Want to mix and match tools on the Festool battery platform? Purchase Festool's new cordless products as combo sets paired with one of Festool's premium cordless saws. Festool tools are always packaged in the company's sustainer organization and storage system. And Festool stands behind their German-engineered products with a three-year all-inclusive wear and tear warranty that covers the tool, battery, and charger. For more information, visit festoolusa.com slash cordless. Not much going on this holiday season? Join Fine Woodworking Unlimited. With more than 40 years of content, we promise to sharpen your skills and keep you entertained through the holidays and beyond. You know how some, some woodworkers say, oh, I'm down here in the studio and I'm making a nightstand. <laughs> When is it a wood shop and when is it a studio? I almost start referring to my shop as a studio and it really. I feel like it's a diff. Well, I, f- I feel as though anything I'm going to say, I'm going to alienate somebody. <laughs> You're like the least controversial person here. <laughs> what? That's not true. <laughs> but I am controversial. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> Deliberately. But, so. So are these people also content creators? Because I can't imagine calling mine a studio. No, no. I I, I think there are a significant number of people who make things out of wood who say the the place where they make the things out of wood is a studio. That's kind of right. I feel like there's something aspirational there that I kind of appreciate. Like anybody can put up pegboard and have a wood shop. Right. Studio? You got dreams, buddy. I like that. I'm still sorry, Barry. No, I'm, I'm still sorry. calling mine a shed. <laughs> <laughs> but what, uh, Anissa? You hang out with a studio crowd. Do you know do? people who who call a studio? Yeah, I'm judging you. You are. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. I know lots of people who say shop and I know lots of people who say studio um hmm. (laughs) that's all I'm saying (laughs) I mean maybe it's so here there's a distinction between like dive bars and swanky restaurants and they're both they're all really great and I don't know what my point is here, but I like a, a good dive bar and I like swanky restaurants too. And I'm going to, I, somebody else take over here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for it. Not that there's anything wrong with that out of Anissa. <laughs> I was, I was reading uh, Adam Savage's book. Uh, what is it? Everything's a hammer or something. And he referred to his, shop as a or some people refer to the shop as a studio and and in in the book and it was it was just one of those like wait a minute so what is the difference between like i used to work in a recording studio yeah and we made records and you make things and they're artistic is a studio are they more like i don't want to use the word di makery like if you're more of a maker would you have a studio I feel like it's it, like maybe the distinction's more of a um, people who consider their work 
artistic as opposed to functional. Okay. But there's crossover there. Absolutely. Tons Absolutely. of it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and and we all know people who who consider their work art and consider their work functional or craft or whatever. And and there's nothing. It's just it's a perspective shift. That's all. But <clears throat> I don't know. All of a sudden, I was thinking, I was like, maybe this is a studio. But I don't consider myself artistic, so no. Do you have to stick to one or the other? Can it be a studio one day and a shop the next? Oh. Or shed the next? Today, I'm feeling like I'm going to work in my studio. <laughs> Tomorrow, I might go back to working in my shop. Yeah. It's like a mood ring. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It depends on whether the camera's on or not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> whether the good microphone's set up and then... All right, well, that conversation bombed. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, all right, let's answer some questions. Question number one is from Scott. I've been making stuff for as long as I can remember. Logging truck went by, sorry. I work as an electrician, and I feel as though I have a good sense of detail and craftsmanship. I've been woodworking for about a year, mostly on pine and poplar as I'm budget conscious. I'm getting two inch and a half by 10 foot long, eight quarter live edge boards of walnut for $20. Yeah. Is that a typo? I, $20 a board foot? That's what, what are we I'm wondering the same here? thing. No, I think, I think it was a buddy thing. That's what I think. And I don't <laughs> want to waste them. When do I step up to higher end wood? So there's two questions here. Where are you getting your wood, dude? <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's just say he's already purchased these boards. No matter even if it was 200. If it was 200, that's good, right? Yeah. So we're talking about 5 quarter. No, 6 quarter. 8 quarter. 8 quarter. 8 quarter. No. Wait, what's that inch and a half then? He's getting two, right? That's what I'm thinking is six Whoa. quarter. Right, but he says eight quarter right after the ten feet long. Oh yeah. Maybe they're two ten feet one and wide, a half by... an inch and a half long. Maybe it's all short grain, and that's why they're so cheap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting two. There's a typo here somewhere. Yeah, it's at the. There may be a couple. There are a few types. It's a good thing we have two woodworking magazine editors on the podcast <laughs> right now <laughs> to catch things like this. Right. Now we need Liz. And <clears throat> okay, so let's but, let's but let's just drop the state. Yeah. When so, do you when do you feel comfortable stepping up to higher end wood? Is the question. Well, Honestly, only Scott can know when he's ready to move up to the higher quality wood. But if he does a mock-up, if he does even just like drawings, full-size drawings on the floor or on a whiteboard or whatever, or a good mock-up, then he knows what he's going to do and he shouldn't be worried about moving up. I I almost took it as though he's worried, maybe not, ne not necessarily about design or something like that, but skill, like, am I going to screw it up? I, I remember buying lumber for my dining room table with Mike. And, and I was like, whew, man, I just spent a bunch of money. He goes, yeah, but at least it's good you know you're not going to screw it up too much and you'll wind up with a table. You're, you're at the point where you're going to wind up with a table out of this. And, you know, it was $400 worth of wood, and but I got a dining room table. Well... Again, if he, I'm not thinking so much of the design. Once he gets the design worked out, if he does like a, I, I mean, isn't that always the case? Aren't you always worried that you're going to screw something up? I mean, I am. <laughs> Every time I'm building something out there, I'm trying to work out all the problems beforehand so I don't screw something up. Usually happens anyway, but you know, when you're when he's going to build this, if he if he mocks it up and even mills up extra wood maybe while he's milling up the walnut if he's milling up some pine or poplar 
just to do test runs on everything, he's going to minimize how much he's at, at how many mistakes he makes. At some point, he's just going to have to go big or go home and cut into the walnut. Right? Halftime speech has been good. <laughs> Suck it up, Buttercup. Pour some dirt on it, get into the studio, and make some shavings. Well, yeah. I mean, you have to, you can sit and look at the wood for a month, and eventually you're going to have to cut into this wood and show that you know what you're doing. And it's 20 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> all right so let's say he never finds a score like this again though you know whatever this deal may be it sounds pretty fantastic Life when does he <laughs> <laughs> the van brings out a different side in you <laughs> of you um <clears throat> i so my take on it was like let's say he burns to the walnut makes something nice and can never afford walnut again that's kind of okay like if you so if he's been building with pine and poplar and he is okay with his what he's put out and stick with it like unless you want to explore or you made you're trying to replicate a piece and something and you made it out of pine and the original was cherry and that's where your piece is falls down and like oh i know next time for like this design i need to use cherry or something different so because I have pine and poplar sitting in the other room right now that I'm making. Like it's, it's, well, if you're happy, then keep going. Also, it's, if, if you've got a solid design and you use time tested techniques, can you really like waste the lumber from a piece of wood? The only time I've ever wasted lumber was when I didn't have the design worked out. And I started building something and didn't know what I was building. And then I lost steam on the whole project. And it wasn't a matter of not being able to, to reach the finish line. It was a matter of, I never put the finish line out there. Uh, yeah. And then six months later, the piece is just warping over in the corner because tabletops are left free and, and all sorts, you know, just, the only time that I have ever truly wasted lumber, I think, is is when I didn't plan enough. Yeah. And I mean, so it's like if you screw up a if you cut a bad mortise and tenon, glue some more wood on that tenon and start again. You know, if you if you cut a bad dovetail with the walnut, sucks, but your piece just got an inch shorter. That's it. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, that's the way it goes. And then also you're working with Walnut is not the same as working with Poplar. There's going to be a learning curve no matter when you step up. There's always something there that's going to be different about it in any type of wood. I remember the first time I did a project in Ash. I think I said to you, Barry, I was like, Oh God, I don't like Ash. I'm not doing this anymore. Yeah. And Two projects later, it's my favorite lumber to work. You know, <laughs> it's just it. There's a learning curve to each species. So, yeah, that's a really good point. There really is. Just do it, <laughs> and share your your lumber supplier. Yeah, re- just with us, though. Yeah, it's everyone not, else. I'm not care. open. <laughs> um. <clears throat> all right. So, question number two. I'm going to start calling this guy mysteriously married Matt. <laughs> what? Because he keeps call- he keeps writing in with like marriage advice, seeking marriage advice. <laughs> <laughs> this is like the wrong plan. Matt, I got you covered, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> On that topic. Uh, let's see. Um, <laughs> After many hours of battling with my wife, (laughs) I have found a design that we both can live with. My wife gave a little ground. I hope you gave some too, Matt, and is willing to let me build the bed and nightstand shown in Michael Cullen's Contemporary Arts and Crafts bed article. There are, however, two obstacles we need to overcome. Uh, My wife loves the nightstands shown in the article photos. I've done a bit of digging, and unfortunately, I can't find plans for these nightstands. 
Hopefully there is something out there that you can refer me to that will at least get me going in the right direction. If not, I can probably cobble something together, but I hate the idea of making a mistake and wasting walnut and $9 and 50 cents a board foot. Uh, second, the bed is primarily made from veneered panels. I understand that sheet goods allow for more flexibility in design, but they are far and they are far more stable, but I kind of hate them. I know it's stupid, but I can't help it. Is there a construction method that I could use that would not dramatically change the look of the headboard and the footboard? I think that I could get away with just a typical panel glue up. Nope but wouldn't have the same control over the grain pattern. I live in an area that's, that has pretty dramatic swings in humidity, so wood movement could be a problem. Do these panels need to be treated differently than a tabletop? So, <clears throat> we ha all right, let's, let's talk about the nightstands. And Anissa could not find the nightstands either. Barry, could you find the nightstands? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a problem. Are they supposed to exist? <laughs> the plan does exist for the nice hands. I will, I will, I will link to it. Uh, All right, full confession. I didn't think they existed, so I never looked. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, but here's the thing. I remembered them from somewhere at some point, and I texted Ben and I said, "I'm, I'm looking for these, and I can't find them anywhere." And Ben found them in less than two minutes. No I kidding. think. Yeah. Really. Yeah. So. So let's talk for a minute about how to search for things on the website, because unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, the way you want to search for things might not always be the way you should search for things. Very and that goes Google. for any website. But um, if you see something in a Michael Cullen article and you're like, oh, I want to build those nightstands. I wonder if they have them. Go to, click on Michael Cullen's name. And that will bring you to every article that Michael Cullen has written. And on page two, there are the nightstands. And the problem with specifically nightstands and side tables and end tables and all of those things is sometimes they're called nightstands. Sometimes they're called end tables. Sometimes they're called side tables. Sometimes they're called small tables. Sometimes they're called sofa tables. But... Anissa's texting me while I'm... <laughs> There's a chat box in squad. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, that's why it's so difficult to search for things. I'm not making excuses for the search functionality on the website, but I'm making excuses for the search functionality on the website. Sometimes the, the wording used by different people in different areas or different settings is different for the same thing. So that's, that's my little rant about searching on the website. Um, yeah. All that said, those nightstands are really pretty. They're incredible. And when you look at the construction details, that's yeah, why right? I'm Yeah. That looks like a hoot. <laughs> Michael Collins, weird, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's yeah. a killer. Pretty, though. But it's, it's, I would have never figured out that they were assembled that way. No. With these hidden tenons and yeah. all sorts of like, Really, really smart details. Um, yeah. So, is anybody going to say anything? Twenty eight percent battery life, Anisa Capsalis. Ben, I, I texted you to keep it a secret. <laughs> Are you at least on low power mode? <laughs> <laughs> It was just a heads up so that maybe the break comes sooner that rather than later. And oh, your laptop's at 20%? Yeah, it was on like 87 when I came out here. Oh. But I guess when I... You laptop? No, it's my, it's my Mac. Oh. Um, but what about, so what about the, the sheet goods thing? Well, I don't see how you're doing this design with solid panels. Well, I'm, I agree. And I'm wondering what his aversion to sheet goods 
is if it's is he have thinking, you met woodworkers well yeah <laughs> but, and i have something to say to him <laughs> <laughs> is his aversion to sheet goods because he's thinking like i'm just going to go to lowe's or home depot and get sheet goods there or is he missing the the shops on veneers part of it because that's a great option. You can completely control the grain. And, and that's, I think that's what he said. Um, he's going to be able to control the grain, uh, the, de the design, the aesthetics of the grain, right? Did I see that somewhere? I think, well, that that's if you did a panel globe. I think that any... So how much was the plywood for your bookcases? Oh, I don't remember. That was Been not inexpensive plywood, right? It that was, was not I mean. inexpensive plywood, but I didn't. That's because I, I bought, I did not saw my own veneers and um, glue them onto a substrate. I bought really good walnut plywood. So I'm thinking that whole the materials for that whole project were probably the plywood was probably 700 bucks. And then I have a lot of, I already had air dried walnut in my shop that I used for everything else. Um, so basically the, just the face frames for the front of the, the boxes, but I didn't, I didn't glue, I got really good plywood because I wasn't going to saw my own veneers and glue them on. Yeah. So that's, that's different than if you have a really nice board and you're not making it, that was a massive project too. So if I was doing that bed, you're not talking about a ton of plywood. So maybe a hundred bucks for a sheet like that, or 150 with nice grain on it. Mm -hmm. But if he's just buying, one sheet of plywood, and I think without doing the, the measurements, he could get away with that, the headboard and the footboard, right? And then he can saw his own veneers and put them on there. Or he can even buy commercial veneers on there and put them on. Let's see. I think so, he buy it. I don't think he's going to get one. Well, 14 inches. I don't think he's going to. I think he's looking at two sheets of plywood, but I, I don't see a way of doing this. So if, if it was going to be a solid wood assembly, you've got to leave room for that assembly to move. So you're looking at 16 inches on one piece, 10 inches on another. And then the footboard is 14 inches. So you got to take into account probably three eighths half an inch of possible wood movement there. So one end or both ends need to be free to move. If you watched Chris Bexford's uh, understanding wood movement webinar, um, you can do the math and that's a lot of possible wood movement. You would have to do a frame and panel to, to make it solid. And I don't think it's going to look the same. And then you're in a marriage trouble again. Oh, that's, yeah, we forgot about that. <laughs> I like I'm the wife says, I gave you this ground and you give me this crap. <laughs> I, okay. I think it's kind of doable. You do? So, and I, yeah. And I have a bunch of ideas. I'm just kind of, kind of ramble off for one. If, so if he wants to work solid wood, but if he wants the benefits of like a stable substrate, he could do that old timey method of, like getting pine or basswood and ripping thin strips and flipping them and gluing them up. And so you have essentially like quarter sawn pine or quarter sawn basswood. And that's what I think federal furniture was veneered over because they didn't have, you know, ply. Um, so if you want to work solid wood, there's that. But so on Cullen's bed, the I'll just talk about the foot board. Mm -hmm. It's frame and panel but it's like not it's has styles but one rail at the top there's no lower rail there are just beads so like no 
nothing that you could panel the frame into, if that is a verb. But I think if he did tenons at the top of the panel and then left a tongue down the panel to keep it registered in the on the legs, I think you could glue the tenons at the top and that would direct all movement down. Just like Mike did on his toolbox with that dog ear tenon. I did it on a chest. I mean, nothing that was 16 inches wide. But then you're losing to- the the strength of the of that panel. And I think you're really putting a lot of uh a lot of faith in those in those top rail joints. Cause you're going to lose all of that racking strength. You're going to lose all of that. I, it might be doable. Do you might be right. thing. Uh, racking strength. Yeah. I, I kind of feel as though we're kind of, we're getting into the territory of <sighs> when you're designing and building something, you're kind of working together to design and think about the build at the same time. So he really loves the design of this bed or his wife loves the design and uh, come together. And so I feel like he's, he's basically, he's redesigning the bed because he doesn't yeah. want to do the same construction. So ultimately he's point. going to end up with a different bed and okay. because he's trying to avoid. So Colin made the decisions that he made for this for the way the bed was constructed based on using the sheet goods and putting it together the way he did. So Matt wants the bed to look the same, but he doesn't want to do the same thing. So I, I think it's kind of a complete redesign to do what he wants to do. Does that... Or are we? Yeah, am I just going around in a in a circle? No, I agree. That's 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 the heart of the matter. You're right. And and maybe suck it up and get some really nice walnut ply. Build the bed and live to fight another day, Matt. <laughs> All right. So, question: If he does walnut ply, because Anissa, that's what you did on your boxes, right? Right. Like on the wall unit. Should he wrap the grain around the whole bed or only three sides? Barry. <laughs> <laughs> Is there some inside? <laughs> He's making fun of me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I think. yeah, I, I know when that's happening. I don't always understand it, though. <laughs> Remember when Anissa's wall unit, she wanted to wrap the grain across the tops of the lowest, the lowest boxes? And Except- did she... Like the leftmost box was flipped. Yeah, so, uh, the grain. Remember the grain. And on the you, top box? you declared you were going to fix it. Did you? I am someday. I am going to fix it someday. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fix my dining room table too. Yeah. <laughs> someday, it's on my list. Okay. We'll ask again in a year or so. All right. All right. Um. Do you want to take a break and plug your computer in? I was just about to text you. I have 17. <laughs> okay. Why don't you go get an extension cord? I will. I'm so sorry. Regardless of your skill level in woodworking or home repair, you want a glue that you can trust. Because a glue that doesn't work can ruin any project in a hurry. Fortunately, Type Bond has the glue you need to get the job done with confidence. From interior glues with strong initial tack and short clamp times to exterior glues with exceptional strength and water resistance, look to Tightbond, the right glue for your next project. For more information, visit tightbond.com, T-I-T-E-B-O-N-D.com. I remember the first time I tried steam bending. I was overwhelmed and didn't know where to begin. Until I read Michael Fortune's article, The Seven Secrets of Steam Bending. People often ask how they can become better woodworkers. I tell them to join Fine Woodworking Unlimited and learn from the experts. With a membership, you can learn at your own pace and discover inspirational techniques and projects in the comfort of your home. All right. Segment potpourri. Theme song here. 
Segment Popori. <laughs> All right. Got that out. I forgot about that. Uh, Barry, you just got your notes for Segment Popori. What do you want? Cool. And I just skimmed them fast enough to reply to your answer in a timely fashion. <laughs> do you want me to go? <laughs> no, no, I got it. All right. Um, so hide glue, my favorite tool of all time for this week. <laughs> and normally I like the open time because I'm a disaster, like inside <laughs> and out. So like, cool. This will just give me some extra breathing room. Um, I just picture and- you looking at the bottle of high glue and saying, this is going to fix it all. It's, it's, it's not going to break it. I know it's not going to break it. Um, I've so been looking recently, for this. <laughs> recently, so working from home, that's my work from home station. Okay. Point to in the background. And that yeah. red box with the divider. I love doing this, demonstrating what's behind me on the screen. <laughs> I wanted to lift up my laptop to the level of my second monitor. So I made a box and I can store files in it and crap. And I dovetailed the corners because why not? Um, And it it was a home project. So I wasn't being really persnickety about the joints, except the one, one of the front corners that was going to look at me all the time, it opened up. I don't know if I didn't get enough clamping pressure. It was a bad joint or something. And I was thought I'd live with it. But then I realized this is going to look at me every day when I sit down at my home office. And I already don't want to be at my home office. (laughs) So... Um, and I used hide glue on it. So all I did was I brought my electric kettle into my studio (laughs) and I heated up some water and I, (laughs) and I was dipping a toothbrush into the hot water, rubbing it into the joint, kind of loosened it up a bit, rubbed in some more hide glue, closed it up and it was tight as a drum. And so that whole reversibility thing, like I've heard people say, and I've always kind of been nervous about doing it. But it worked a treat, and now the joint is closed. And it was all thanks to hide glue. If I had used, you know, normal type bond, I could never have had Pekovich over and look at my home office station. Hold on a second. Studio shop. (laughs) Wait, didn't Phil Collins do a song that kind of what? Studio? Yeah. <laughs> you can combine them. Uh-huh. And that stop. Sorry, Barry. Okay, so we <laughs> joked about putting out a calendar. You what? know how we joked about putting out like a fine woodworking calendar? Yeah, yeah. I don't Fine Woodworking mixtape of oh. 80s hits remixed to woodworking themes. Eh? Ben? I don't think it's a good idea. You could do the do 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 do. You could do the drum roll. No. Fine, whatever. I'm leaving. <laughs> wait, wait, hide glue. <clears throat> so, um, are you hot hide glue or uh, cold hide glue? Mm-hmm. No, 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 no. Cold hide. Hot hide seems like a drag. Um, and that one tacks up too quickly. So sometimes it seems cool, like for a rub joint, that seems super beneficial. Um, I'm never going to hammer veneer anything. So yeah, I stick with the liquid hide and, and shop hack studio hack to warm it up. I just put it in my back pocket and then proceed to work for the next half hour. (laughs) (laughs) And it's great. Next time on Shop Talk Live, I got hide glue all over my couch. <laughs> Did I tell you how I figured out glue was getting into my armpits? I solved the mystery. So, is this real? You've always mentioned yeah, no. glue in the armpit hair. And- it was, I think it was my first blog for the magazine. And but Craig Thibodeau wrote a comment. He's like, dude, I think you're doing it wrong. <laughs> it was so I wear an apron. And all the excess glue I rub onto my apron. And because I don't have a Do lot of... Do you wear a shirt under your apron? Okay, so this it's not story... not the shirt I'm worried about. Yeah. It's not the shirt. <laughs> and when it's warm, 
Like I've worked in unheated shops when it's warm, I'll often wear just like a cutoff shirt. Any glue squeeze out, I rub onto the apron. The apron looks like a disaster. But because I don't have a lot of space, I will squat down to like put panels on the ground or whatever, or like tighten okay. up clamps so panels will often end up on the ground. Me squatting down to do it. This enormous apron covered in wet glue will scrunch up and shove itself into my armpits. And I had no idea what was going on until one day I did it with long sleeves on and the glue got on the long sleeves. And like I looked down and the sleeve was next to the apron next, you know, the glue on it. Like, oh, there's a reason glue's been getting into my armpits. So I, I otherwise I had no idea. And it was kind of jarring, you know, like I don't want I don't want to look into that behind that door. Like how high glue is getting into my armpits, but now I know. I don't know. Pretty- that's that's something yeah. that that's that's a beast you need to to face head on as soon as you find it. No, dude. How do I have glue a, in my that's armpit? That's a Jenga hair. tower. That's a <laughs> you, you start pulling it stuff. The whole tower is coming down, man. Um, I have one spot on my apron that I glue all the rub on. That I glue all the rub on to. That I rub all the glue on to. <laughs> You said it's like a stalagmite, right? Like it just sticks it's, right out. It's growing in thickness. Yes. That's it's, awesome. It, yeah. Uh, but be careful with your aprons, folks. Mm-hmm. Or you'll wind up with, like Dima. Uh, Why? Because it's high glue. You can just rub your armpit really fast when it's closed <laughs> and it heats up and clean it right up. <laughs> Anisha, do you want to go? Uh, sure. Or I have just, a school. Or, what? Okay. All right. What were you going to say? I was going to say, do I not want to follow this one? Um, it's up to you. What do you have? <laughs> Maybe I'll go. Okay. Uh, I have a <laughs> technique. And uh, it will it's hinting at something coming up in a, in a little bit. But I made a whole mess of uh, throw plate inserts for my table saw. Nice. I made like five just because that's how much half inch MDF I had lying around. And I figured that'll probably last me for quite a long time. My brother has the same table saw, so he'll get a couple. And, um, but in order to get the throw plate to sit perfectly flush on the table saw, most people will put like a little, uh, screw in there, a little, uh, insert screw. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can adjust it that way just to get the height on all four little feet. Perfect. And I could have done that. I didn't have any, um, any screws that would work well for that. And I remembered an old method of work tip that I saw years ago, probably before I started working at the magazine, but somebody would uh, use epoxy putty and make a little ball of epoxy putty and put one ball on each of the little feet for the throat plate and just push the throat plate down flush with the top of the table saw. And then the epoxy putty sticks to the insert plate. You've got wax paper or tape or something on the bottom to keep that epoxy putty from sticking to the table saw itself. That sounded like a great idea. I didn't have any epoxy putty. It's always one of those things. It's like you should just have lying around, but I don't. So I used hot melt glue. And I just put a couple of thick dabs of hot milk glue on each of the little, uh, f- little what, what would you call the little feet that come off the table saw to, to put the throw plate on feet, maybe I don't know, whatever. Those little, tabs those little nubs? little tabs, little tabs or nubs. Yeah. Put a, put a pretty good size gob of hot milk glue on there. Let it set up for just like 10 seconds because the I, the glue straight out of the gun, it, it'll just run everywhere. Um, let it set up for like 10 seconds, push the throw plate down, use a, another board to make sure it was perfectly flat and the glue stuck to the MDF, did not stick to the table saw um, and I have a perfectly flush insert plate for my table saw without like any effort at all. I love I was, that. You posted a video about that, I think on Instagram. Yeah. Or picture. I love that. It's smart. I was really, really well chuffed. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. 
Now, I don't want to follow that with a smooth move. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm doing this experimental built-in. <clears throat> in I'm building a, a built-in cupboard shelf thing with doors into a doorway, like a recessed doorway that we don't use. Um, and I'm using a bunch of maple that um, from a tree that we... I cut down in the yard probably 10 years ago. So it's been sitting there. It's, it has spalting in it. It's pretty, pretty wood. Um, so the built-in is probably like 36 by 80, something like that. And um, fits right into this recessed doorway. And the maple was cut. I think the longest pieces were five feet. So it's experimental in that instead of running a whole bunch of long um, face frames down the side and then, you know, I have a whole bunch of shelves made and then instead of doing long pieces down the side, I, I have, and it's a weird thing, I have to kind of overlap the, the face frames to go against the wall um, where this thing is going to get pushed in. So it, I have short pieces in between the longer horizontal pieces. So instead of doing the long um, uprights, they're shorter in between the longer horizontals. Um, so that's experimental. But I'm going to have a bunch of, maybe it's kind of like a Tansu-esque looking doors. And um, they're all going to be a little bit different, but it's the whole thing is with the maple. So I needed to put, I face frame this thing and I did it in my dining room. Instead of carrying the box back and forth into the shop, I had this thing on horses in the dining room for about a week while I did the face frames. And I would run back and forth to the shop and cut everything to size. And I was clamping the thing in there. I had all my clamps in the house. And I'm doing it piecemeal because, you know, I'm I have I have the kids and the, you know, everything's going on. And, you know, I would just do a little bit at a time. And so where these doors are going to be, I needed to put a center piece as part of the face frame on each shelf, on each section. There needs to be another um, style that goes in between the longer box for each shelf. It's kind of weird to explain. But basically, I face frame the whole thing and I forgot all of those styles, all of them. So for each, so there are five different shelves that are gonna all have doors. I forgot to put that style in there. So now I have to go back and figure out how I'm gonna, I know, I know how I'm going to do it because the face frame comes, um, it's not flush on the one side. So I'm gonna actually put a tab and I'm gonna make it a little bit wider. And I can really just kind of glue that in and secure it that way. And it's going to be the door stops, but I'm not sure yet how I'm going to secure the bottom on the, on the part that's flush. It's so specific. It's hard to explain, but basically I forgot the style and the whole thing is framed out. So you need to be able to get the piece in mm -hmm. and secure it. Can you do and like, I can you do jowl dowels from beneath, like put it in drill through the bottom and dowels or something? What? what? I, I really, I really can't because there's no way to get that piece in there. So you're, you're basically trying to piece in something I, and I'm not going to have the wiggle room to, to get it in uh, with a dowel or a biscuit yeah. or a domino or anything like that. So the, the face frame protrudes down from the plywood a little bit on each shelf so I can get one side I can secure it from behind onto that it's just that I'm you know I don't know what I'm going to do yet glue you'll, you'll figure something out you'll figure something <laughs> oh, I, will. I would love to see you toenail in it I, <laughs> think, I, I, think like, I might I have that little nailer I think I might oh, yeah. the 23 gauge nailer I might glue it try that because the one side is going to one end is going to be really secure i'm i might just try and do that what about 
Can you glue pocket it screw it? And you'd see them. You oh, you can't pocket screw it from the back. No, I can't. I can't get in there at this point. Oh, oh no. Oh. Maybe. Oh. Maybe I could do that from the back. It's just, yeah. <laughs> so, just, I completely forgot. Because I'm running around trying to do, oh, here, let me get these done. Uh, let me clamp these. Oh, let me go feed the children. Oh, let me go to work. Let me, you know, and it just, so after the fact, it's going to be a lot more difficult. I might try getting in from, I'll pull the whole thing out at this point. Okay. Oh, so behind. you can pull the whole oh, thing yeah. out at least. I still can. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's not going to be pretty, but I guess you'll never see it. And just don't tell anyone. Right. Well, anyone else. <laughs> did you curse when you realized what happened? Or did you go, yep. No. Have you never like, <laughs> that tracks. So like that. <laughs> no, I made some big mistake the other day. I went, yep. <laughs> that was bound yeah. to happen. Yeah. Yep. Uh, uh, wow. All right. Well, let's see. Question number three. Barry. The last time I was on the podcast with Mike, he complained that he doesn't like smooth moves without like a resolution. You know, like, and then it was fixed. Because that's what I did. I'm like, yeah, I totally screwed up. Period. You know what it's like? <laughs> and I laughed at him, but that's true. And he's just like, and yeah, yeah. And then I screwed up. And I like I need the other part of the story. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no. My condolences. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. Uh, question number three. Uh, I've I've been avoiding this one because I don't like it being about me. But please ramble about how cool getting into Luthery has been. What have been some of your favorite resources for learning Luthery stuff? Any particular books or VHS collections? Hmm. So. I, so my follow-up to this is how you're getting questions from the past. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Marty McFly. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And now it's awkward because now I'm supposed to talk. Normally one of you talks first. So wait, hold on. Can I, I can, I can like grease it up All right. because those Stu Mac videos on YouTube. Yeah. Even from an entertainment standpoint, so I used to play guitar and I currently try to woodwork. And so there's some kind of, you know, like context for me, but the Stumac videos are incredibly charming, yeah. especially with Dan early wine. And I'm assuming, and they're typically quick hits, like three to eight minutes, you know, that they don't seem terribly in depth, but I'm guessing Ben, are they, are they as informative? I don't know. I, I, I think I think they give you ideas. I think they uh -huh. Stumac is incredibly good at making their little videos and and you being like I need that tool and I want to break your guitar. Dan early and, I know. And Dan Earlywine is like this Luthery grandpa who like <laughs> you're, you're you're like, "Oh, can I just hang out and have some sweet tea with you?" <laughs> you know like, like Yeah, <laughs> like, you're right. I want to sit on a porch with Dan Earlywine. Mm -hmm. Um I think for me, I have been, I have been like on purpose, not digging too deeply into Luthery content. Really? Like Stu Mac uh, is a big YouTube channel for me. There's also a guy, um, Ted Woodford, who's a Luther, Luthier in Canada, who just about once a week, he's just like, this is what's on my bench today. And like, I'm doing a neck reset and he just, it's just very informal and very cool, relaxing videos to watch. But build wise, uh, there was a guy who I used to watch, um, Tommy Hovington, again, Canadian, I believe, uh, T O M Y H O V I N G T O N. And he would be, and the reason why I got into his videos is he was building arch top style instruments. Uh, so mostly things in the mandola mandolin family. Um, I, I watched all of his videos for a while, but honestly, this, the thing that I love about Luthery is 
it's just woodworking. There's really nothing that is outside the, outside, except for the very, very functional, like fretting and um, building bridges and things like that. It's all woodworking. So when it comes to hot pipe bending, I learned that from Michael Fortune's videos and article um, or steam bending, the same thing. I, I, it's, I really think that more people should be diving into Luthery if you're a guitar player or whatever. I don't think that, and Mike, Mike and I used to talk about it all the time where he, he was like, oh, the problem with, with building a guitar is you start building a guitar and all of a sudden you have $1,000 worth of jigs and that's all you do is build guitars. And I can't argue with him there because now all of a sudden I have a whole bunch of jigs that I built I didn't buy. And now all I do is build ukuleles. Um, and I definitely want to keep building furniture, but, um, I think it was, it was a fairly natural thing for me, but if anyone is like on the fence about building an instrument, get one of the Stumac kits. Um, I've built for your brother, Barry, I built Mm -hmm. a, a kit ukulele and I'm about to order three that I'm building for people on Instagram. For real. Um, and it's so much fun and you wind up with a thing that you wind up with an instrument that you built and there's nothing about Luthery that is outside of the realm of most woodworking shops and or um, woodworkers. The skills all apply to furniture and anything that a woodworker would want to be getting into. It's like, Oh, crap, I'm really good at hot pipe bending now. That's going to make my furniture more difficult, you know, like, (laughs) or working to very precise measurements, you know, measuring to, you know, half a millimeter for this or that. And I think it's all stuff that applies. There's nothing different there. Well, I also think it's super cool to be able to, I can't do it, but to be able to make this instrument to be able to do the woodworking part of it and make the instrument and then to actually be able to do that and then take that instrument and make something else like music. It's just, it's really cool. Well, and also it's like everybody, every woodworker knows somebody who's into playing an instrument. So even if you're just curious, get, get one of the ukulele kits that are a hundred bucks, like for one of the good ukulele kits. And Last night I had posted on Instagram that like, you're going to wind up with a ukulele that's worth $250. It's not like, it isn't a great kit when you're done. It's not Mm -hmm. the end all be all uke. Um, But you're going to wind up with a much better instrument than what you put into it financially. And it's just super, super fun to, to build a thing and then play it or, or, or hear it be played by someone, you know? So one of, one of those kits, do you think it would be something that I could farm out some of it and do it with my kids? Like, do you think they could do? Part oh of no, it? I totally think you could do all of it with your kids. Um, because the, so the aspects of Luthery that are outside the realm of tools that most woodworkers have, um, the specialty things are, uh, anything related to the fretboard. So fret sawing and fret rate fretboard radiusing, because there's a gentle radius to, to most fretboards. Um, that would be tough to do without investing either a lot of time building jigs or money buying jigs. Um, the other thing would be uh, the neck joint and all of those things are covered in the kits. So like, I think that I honestly think that Stu Mac probably assembled a kit that could be put together without a wood shop. Really? With a hand drill and. Oh, dude. You know, ra- like flushing the top and bottom plate to the sides. It's a heck of a lot easier with a router table or a router, you know, things like that. It could be done with a knife and sandpaper it would be a pain in the butt but you could but i really think you could do you could build two of them with with the kids 
Cool. Awesome. I think I might. Yeah. I, I, I think that the kits are a great way to get started. Now I haven't built a kit guitar yet and I started building everything from scratch. I saw the frets. I did, you know, I did everything and I don't think it's a great way to get started because it was really overwhelming and it's, it's a lot. And there's even think- times now that I feel like I'm not going, like, I think going forward, I don't think I'm going to saw the frets anymore. Cause it no costs, seven, you know, the, the fretboard blank is like $12 and for $7, they'll, they'll saw the frets for you. It's like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I'm yeah. spending two yeah. hours doing this and you know, with a hundred dollars saw and a G it just is, this yeah. is a waste of time. I've proven I can do it. Yeah. Ben, I think we haven't, I think we did an article on uh, making a kick guitar. There was a video that was um, from the Woodworkers Guild of America that we, that we posted on the website too. Um, I think Steve Scott was the editor on a kick guitar article. Okay. If I, I might be mistaken, but I, I'm pretty sure. I'm going to go to findwoodworking.com slash magazine dash index. And this is another great guitar. way to search. Yeah. Your first guitar, Steve Scott, 221. Oh, sweet. See, if I were Mike Pekovich, I would have had that issue he'd, number. He'd stare at the spines. Of the <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and then he'd pick it out. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> so, yeah, it looks like it, it's the byline is Steve Scott, and it looks like it's George um, uh, Vandriska. Uh, Vandriska doing it, though. Um, yeah, but kit guitars, super, super fun. Kit ukuleles. And again, you're like, it's a hundred bucks. It's, it's a great project. So if anyone's trying to, wanting to get into Luthery, it's, it's hard to go wrong there. So if someone wanted to make an electric, cause yeah. you see like the, the neck is the pain in the butt. Like that's where things kind of get more specific. Do you think they'd get enough experience making a body? Yeah, like a probably. solid body working off a template and center lines and all that. I would no, I haven't built an electric. Um, yeah. So if you bought a neck mm-hmm. and wanted to build a body, you got to get the neck pocket, right? You got to get the neck angle, right? Uh, okay, cool. But again, that's probably some template routing and finessing. Uh, but then you've got the added fun and joy of soldering electronics and doing all that yeah. stuff. Um, there's, there's, it, that's a different beast. So I can't speak on it. For, okay. Fine, um, fair. I, I definitely want to build an electric. Uh, I have some, so it's, it's a heck of a lot less uh, intriguing for me, but yeah. Mm-hmm. So, all right. But I'll I'll link to all of those YouTube channels, and there's a couple of books that I got. Uh, there's an Archtop book that I got that I follow some of. Um, uh, it's not a very good book. <laughs> it's got bare minimum information, but I'll I'll link to it. Um, I lost my script. There it is. All right, question number four is from Clay, and I think we need to get through this one quick. Um, I've been getting into woodworking for the past year. I've built up a small shop with my garage in in my garage with a table saw, miter saw, sanders, and routers, as well as a drill press. My wife wants me to build a farmhouse style trestle table. The build, the base will be made up of a four by four center legs with one inch thick X braces. I have never cut a mortise and tenon. I don't have the budget for a domino and I don't want to build a table that will crash to the ground with a Thanksgiving feast on it. Uh, he sent us a picture of the X-Brace. So center, center style, 245s coming off top and bottom. Um, I have a doweling jig, but I don't know what size I should use and whether it will be strong enough. Using biscuits doesn't seem like it would provide enough strength, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, what do you think, Barry? I would go loose mortise and tenon on this guy. Like, I don't know if you, mm. the biscuits could work. I think it may be a drag to reference that biscuit, the, the actual tool, because there's a reveal. 
like a gap between the X and then like the upper and lower members of the trestle. So I thought, because I made a farmhouse table very similar to this with my brother a few months ago. And it was like a cool opportunity for him to learn loose mortise and tenon. And you're working with these big members, which could be a struggle to get over your machines, like bring the wood to the machine. So we loose mortise and tenon let us take the machine to the tool. And, and it seems like a good place to practice the technique. Yeah, it seems like a good place to practice that technique. Although, I mean, dowels could work, biscuits would work, because those X's aren't doing too, too much for you, right? I know. I think that they're doing a lot in this regard. How wide this, is the and... tabletop? Sorry, they wouldn't. A biscuit wouldn't. If a biscuit's weaker than a mortise and tenon, it's not going to fail there, right? Like, it's not getting weird racking or. Okay, so there's a there's a top um of the trestle which would could be, you know, a rail if you will. Mm -hmm. So let's assume that he's mortise and tenoning that one as well or okay. fl or floating mortise and tenon whatever. And then the so there's there's one of those on the top, one on the bottom and then an X brace, so 245 degree buttresses or braces. Um I think I think you, there's no way of doing this table. This is a great place to start learning floating to tenon joinery or floating mortise and tenon or, or housed or regular mortise and tenon. This is, you got to do it. You know, mm -hmm. I don't think that there's a way because you're going to do it for the top. You got to do it for the X braces too, right? You, you could screw them. You could dowel them, but why? Yeah, I'm with you. What do you think? So how, uh, well, I was going to, I think the floating tenons are, is a good idea. Um, he has, um, he has a drill press. He could do a lot of them on the drill press yeah. um, hmm. and just chisel them clean. I don't know those angles. He could use a hand drill. Are we talking about like, how are we talking about getting those mortises? My two favorite jigs for those are one from McLaughlin that he used in his Adirondack chair. And it's just like a mortise quarter, quarter inch piece of plywood or something. And he does a, not a barren guide a bit, bushing. Bushing yeah. to, and the, the template has center lines, vertical and horizontal, and then you just nail it in place. Those are cool because they're easy and you can put them anywhere except those holes kind of remount. The other one I love is Paolini's version. I think he has a video of it on the site. Um, and it's just a fence with the mortise template inside on another piece of plywood. Still routing it out. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Routing it. Yeah. I, I avoided using bushings or bearings on a, on a router for way too long. Well, and they, hi. they really just Math. make everything yeah it was like oh i've got this yeah. offset all of a sudden yeah. and but especially i don't know if i've ever used anything other than the three quarter inch bushing because i make all of my my routing jigs out of three quarter inch mdf glued ca glued together and oh and like so you sandwich them up i sandwich them between you know between a, a piece of three quarter inch mdf to give you that, yeah, that center and then what? Then that that three quarter inch bushing goes in that gap, and whatever size bit you oh. use, that's the size your mortise. Uh, yeah, I think a fl you're right, Barry. I was thinking a a, a tenon, but doing a forty five mm -hmm. degree tenon on the X brace would be tough. A floating mortise and tenon. I'm with you. Yeah. And with that like long middle stretcher, like getting that over your table saw is a bear you know yeah um and so he does have a through tenon i say fake it <laughs> fake, the, <laughs> fake the through tenon on the side for the yeah yeah but i don't know that one you could drill and chisel true yeah. true true, right. true anisa so you you agree with barry as well i do all right well first time for everything <laughs> you what? said we have to wrap this up quickly <laughs> like, come on. tell barry he's right <laughs> 
All right. So we had a, a, a listener write in, uh, Mike wrote in, love the show. I feel compelled to write to you because just moments ago, I experienced my first kickback event. Yikes. In fact, it happened while listening to episode 220, not long after a lengthy discussion on kickback in response to a listener question. And Barry's comment about needing to respect the weird physics of a table saw. They're weird. Now I have egg on my face, but luckily no lasting injuries. I think that the initial impact occurred on my hip, right where my belt is. So there were several layers of material to cushion. I consider myself super cautious at the table saw and have never done anything this stupid. The small 12 inch by three and a half inch board had I, I had just ripped, got hung up mid cut because the throat plate had slipped a little below the height of the table. I wiggled it through safely, then decided to use the edge of the cu just cut board to run along the throat plate to get it to bump at the table to verify that that was the problem. Somehow I managed to let go of the board, dropping it into the blade, which uh -huh. I had left running. Yes, I realize how ridiculous sure. this sounds from someone who just described themselves as super cautious at the table saw. I was definitely not giving 100% attention to the task at hand, uh, which is another thing that Ben discussed in that episode. For my own good, I will henceforth reserve listening to Shop Talk Live only while driving, sitting quietly, or during handwork. Thanks for reminding us that we all need reminders on safety, even when we think we are super cautious. Shaw. Glad he's safe. Yeah. yeah. But I wanted to share that one because I love the attitude of I'm so, like, I cringe anytime somebody says, oh, I'm really careful. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah. Stack the odds in your favor. Thank you, Mike. Um, all right. Anybody have any quick recommendations? Ooh, I do. Um, a podcast called You're Wrong About. Have you heard of this? No. Um it's you're wrong about and it takes things like just it, the topics are all over the place so you, it could be anything from like did yoko ono break up the beatles or the <laughs> you know like or um o, the oj simpson case or tanya harding it basically takes things from the past it's these two journalists who do this podcast part-time um and they they debunk all the myths that have come up because of the way you know media portrayed everything or um, the way things just played out. So it's you're wrong about, and it just highlights what the myths are, what actually happened. Um, it's kind of cool. Yeah, that's gonna go on the list. The topics are all, all over the place. I want to recommend Ear Hustle a podcast that I have uh, avoided listening to. For some reason, everyone said ear hustle, ear hustle, ear hustle. And then two times in a row, I saw John Binson with an ear hustle t-shirt. And was like, you know okay. what? That's all the recommendation I need. John Binson right. t-shirt. <laughs> it's incredible. Drove up to Maine the, the other day and listened to nothing but ear hustle and just talk about a perspective shift. It's, uh, it's, it's a podcast made by prisoners in San Quentin. Uh, um, this one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's just about prison life and it's not. Yeah. It's just good for everyone to, mm -hmm. to listen to another perspective every now and then. So, Anybody so my else? recommendation is from Mike Corsack and I took it on. So I'm recommending it too, but it's a podcast called, <laughs> uh, is it wins a change? And it is exploring the possibility that the CIA funded the Scorpion song Winds of Change to foment the fall of the USSR. I, I, I got served and, an ad of, yeah. And it's ridiculous, but it's, it is so well done and so engaging. Because normally I don't want to learn one thing about the Scorpions, but this <laughs> podcast is fantastic. It's a lot of fun. All right. Yeah. Cool. Jeff, do you have a podcast recommendation? Uh, I don't leave the house. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have time to listen to other podcasts. I've got too many podcasts on my own. <laughs> Fine home building. <laughs> <laughs> I just found out I'm doing another one now. Oh, wow. 
<laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all for this episode of Shop Talk Live. If you have questions you'd like us to answer on the show, send them into shoptalkatalk.com. If you're watching on YouTube, smash that thumbs up button. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Thank you for listening. If you've been waiting to become a subscriber to Fine Woodworking, now is the time. Follow us on social media and be sure to visit finewoodworking.com frequently as we will have some pretty incredible sales coming your way this holiday season. That's it. The kids are back in school and there's more internets happening. Oh. We all seem better though. Like Anissa's average. Ben, you're very good. Yeah. Now I'm worried about the kids <laughs> yeah, though. Cool. All our internets got better? What happened to the children? <laughs> <laughs>